This is crazy. This is so crazy that I'm standing here. Ah! I used to come here. My husband came here to get toys at Christmas from Goodyear and used to practice. Oh, thank you. Used to practice majorette across the street where there are no buildings anymore. <laughs> um, I have to tell you, I, this is... Don't ever say to God that you don't want to be comfortable. Because he takes you at your word. A few years ago, I was suffering from uh, intense pain. And I had a daughter that went through cancer treatment. But because of my pain, I couldn't help with her six kids. It about killed me. My husband went through treatment. It was awful. And I spent a lot of time in a lazy boy. And I don't want to do that anymore. I got a new hip, and I was like, good to go. So... Um, it led to here. I, I saw this conference last year on Facebook, and um, I get a lot of flack from my friends because I really love technology. I love it because it just shows young women out there fierce for Jesus and honest and um, authentic and transparent in ways I can't even imagine. Um, and technology is fun for me. Um, but anyway, I saw it on Facebook, and I thought, ooh, I like the premise of this. I like it's not in a church, although I love local church, and I've always been involved in my local church. I loved um, that it was about Akron, because I love Akron, and I love Jesus, and I love women. So, so I put it on my calendar, but I didn't get a ticket, because weekends I usually reserve for my husband. But it came up on my calendar and reminded me the Friday before, and I thought, hmm, I don't think we're doing anything tomorrow. So I said to my husband, are we doing anything? He said, no. So I go on, and it's sold out, of course. And I was like, uh oh, anybody got a ticket that you're not going or somebody's not going to make it? And some dear girl, I don't know her name, said, yeah, I'll leave my name at the desk. Don't worry about the money. And I showed up, and it was such a blast. It was so... I just, you know, I'm in my 60s, and, and I'm decreasing, and you guys are increasing. You young people, all these young women that are passionate and purposeful for Akron, it just blessed my socks off. I didn't even know anybody that had anything to do with it. I saw a couple friends from church, but I hadn't um, expected that. So I want to start off by talking about... Um, my name. I, I like my name. And I think that everybody's name means something. I've actually done pictures for my grandkids. I'm kind of an artsy fartsy, so I've painted some pictures for my grandkids and applied scriptures to what their name means. I owe my granddaughters that are here that are college age because I started kind of after them. So I owe you. Um, but anyway, um, I think it's important. And so my name, uh, after I came to Christ, I looked up some family that I hadn't seen since I was little. And my grandma and I built a relationship. And uh, she gave me the story of my name. She said, you know, you were born on my birthday. And your mom called and said, I'm going to name my baby after you. And she goes, uh, no, you're not. I don't like my name. Well, her name was Lila. So we became really close friends because... Growing up in the 50s and 60s with a name like Lila, I mean, it's probably popular now, but it wouldn't have been a good thing. So her middle name was Miriam. Now, if you remember um, your Bible stories, Miriam in the Bible was the sister to Moses, and she was a caregiver. She watched over her son, or her son, sorry, that she watched over her brother when he was put in the basket in the Nile, and then when the princess found him, she ran up and said, I know somebody that can be the wet nurse, which was... Moses' mom. She then later joined her brothers as they led the nation of Israel out of slavery in Egypt. She also um, got in trouble for her words. <laughs> and I will tell you right now, it's going to be a miracle that I stay within the 20 minutes because that I like to talk. So I'm prayed and fasted that I could do this. <laughs> So anyway, she got in trouble for her words, which I have done. My girls are here. They can attest, all my friends. Um, but then also she was well-loved because when God, um, you know, when she spoke the words in rebellion against Moses because he married a woman of color, that makes me just cringe, um, he struck her with leprosy. 
and it said that the whole nation waited and did not move until she was restored. And her brothers went to bat in prayer that God would restore her. And I am well loved. I have so many people here that God has blessed me with that surround me, everyone from my oldest friend from grade school to my college age granddaughters. And I, am, I have felt so supported and so loved. So I want to tell you my story now. That was my personality. This is my story. Um, I was raised in a single family home. Um, that top left picture by a single mom, that's on Superior Avenue off of East Avenue. And I was raised all over Akron. So I went to seven grade schools. My oldest brother, my oldest siblings kind of suffered more because we quit moving when I was in sixth grade. He was a senior. And um, it was hard. My sister's here and she's kind of shy, so it was really traumatic for her. Um, me, I just kind of took it in stride. I don't know. I was just kind of ignorant. I don't know. It's what, what it was. Um, but it gave me a love for Akron, not just one's neighborhood, but all over. And I, I've often called myself an alley cat. I used to go to a little church right around the corner here um, for 30 years, and we would prayer walk, and nobody wanted to walk the alleys. And I'm like, oh, I grew up on an alley. I walked down the alley. And, of course, we did. And then there was two neighbors fighting, and that was interesting. And we prayed and walked away. <laughs> so... Um, yeah, so I was raised in the 50s by a single mom who brought her mother in to care for us, our grandmother, who didn't raise her own children. So it was, it was traumatic. And, you know, it, a lot of, we, many, many, many of us, more than not, were raised in a dysfunctional family. Um, my mom remarried, but I really never had a, a nurturing, our family was never nurturing. In fact, our siblings, my siblings and I, we've never, all, all of us, been together since we've been adults, ever. People have moved away and so forth, but it's not really an excuse. We just really aren't close. I'm close to uh, my sister. But um, anyway, I started in my teens just um, chasing after love in all the wrong places. I, a um, uh, charismatic boy came along, and he swept me off my feet, and he told me what to wear and who to talk to and who not to sit with and how to live. And I listened like I was pulled by my nose because I was so desperate for love. Well, that led to me being pregnant as a junior. And by the time I was a senior, I was graduating. I was getting divorced and I was a single mom. And that next picture is of me at my mom's. I've got granny glasses on. Now these kind of glasses, you know, these are real popular now, but when I was growing up, I never wore glasses in school. I would slide them on and slide them off. And that was my graduation gift. People went together in my family. We didn't, we didn't do big parties, um, but they gave me enough money to buy my first pair of glasses that I could wear. I, I don't have to wear them now because I had cataract surgery. But um, anyway, uh, I graduated from high school, was determined to do that, and um, started looking for a job. Um, college wasn't in the books. I mean, there was no loans. There was no grants. There was nothing for single mom. So anyway, I just started working and finding jobs and it led up to, and within two years, I was making a good living, had a house I bought near Summit Lake, a sweet little house. But on the weekends, I was self-medicating. Because as I was growing up, one of the things that, a couple of things that happened to me, uh, predators found me. So I was abused quite a bit. And I was also raped as a child. And then during my drug years, I was I raped again. So um, I, on the weekends, drugs, alcohol, sex, rock and roll, sounds like a cliche. It sounds like it's been romanticized, but it was ugly and it was awful. And I couldn't even finish sentences, but I worked. I was really highly functioning as an addict. I worked, but, you know, shot up heroin on the weekends. And so I knew I needed help. I knew I wanted an answer to life, and I searched, and I don't have the time to go into all that, but... Uh, sh long story short, I was also suicidal, tried to commit suicide a couple times. So I remember this one night I was sitting in my house and uh, my daughter, when I was doing the partying, fortunately, I had in-laws that took her on weekends and was so great and protected her and I'm so grateful for that. Um, but I remember sitting in my house one night and I, another relationship had, you know, I'd been, had crashed and I, I didn't even turn the lights on. I was in this deep black depression and 
I just kind of got up and went and crawled into bed. And I remember praying and saying, God, help me. And an audible voice actually said to me, who are you talking to? There is no one here. And I turned over and I went to sleep and forgot about it, literally till years later. But a month later, my sister called me, my lovely supportive sister, and said, hey, so-and-so's in town and they're Jesus freaks. You want to talk to them? And I'm like, yeah, I do. So I went over and visited with them and they shared the gospel with me. Now, my mom was good about taking us to church. We went to a, a traditional church. And so I believed in God. I believed in the Bible. I believed that Jesus died on the cross. But I had never heard that he actually came for me and for you. That when he walked the sinless life and was hung on the cross, that he took the punishment for every single thing I've ever done. And that he bore the shame. And my lifestyle had poured shame onto me. I was full of shame. And so it was, it was a struggle that night because of the darkness, that I, the choices I had made that were so dark. But I said yes. I said yes to Jesus. And it started my adventure like I can't, 45 years later on April 7th. I have been walking with him, and God has done mighty things, and there have been really hard things. Like, literally, after I came to the Lord, I had a nice house, and then later, I had an apartment with rat holes, but you know what? I was so much happier and at peace because I had Jesus, you know? So when they asked me to speak, Noelle, I met with Noelle, and I didn't know what she wanted to talk about. I, I mentor women, so I thought, well, maybe she wants to pick my brain about something or whatever. But the Lord had quietly said to me, no, she's going to ask you to speak. And I was like, well, I don't speak publicly. I have not in 20 years led a retreat or anything. I used to do it, but I haven't in many years. And um, when he said that to me, I thought, huh, I'm probably supposed to do it because I really don't have anything to say. I'm going to have to really see what you have to say, Lord. And so one of the things, as my adventure has been with the, with the Lord, is one of the things that I loved, that I learned right away, was that the Bible had answers for everything. Everything. And so I am in love with this bread that is food for us, if we would sit and partake and ask God to feed us. And so I said, Lord, give me some scripture. And so he did. And the scripture that were, oh, wait. Before I tell you that, oh, no, that, that's right. See, now here, here's where it's awkward because I've never done this. I didn't even know what a PowerPoint was a couple months ago. <laughs> I said, a, a friend of mine was preparing something for our church, and she goes, I'm working on my PPT. And I'm like, what's a PPT? You know? <laughs> so she literally helped me m make this. So I'm kind of a little creative, so I loved it. Um, and I want to end with, I'm sorry, this point right here. This is my family last month. We celebrated 40 years of marriage, and we took our family to Florida. <laughs> And um, everyone could, that could come came, and um, we just had a blast. And you know what I love the most? Just hanging with my grandkids and hearing my adult kids enjoy each other. My siblings and I, you know, we don't have that, but my adult kids do. I'm so, so blessed. So here's the scripture. Don't call to mind the former things or ponder the things of the past. Behold, I'll do something new now. It will spring forth. Will you not be aware of it? I will make a roadway in the wilderness, rivers in the desert. The beasts of the field will glorify me, the jackals and the ostriches. Because I've given waters in the wilderness, rivers in the deserts, to give drink to my chosen daughters, to the women who I form for myself, will declare my praise. So the first verse that I'm going to talk about is don't call to mind the former things nor ponder the things of old. So the first step I took was to be free, to accept Christ and be free. I did a retreat many years ago, probably 20 years ago, on the, the butterfly and all the aspects of that, uh, of God's transforming power in our lives. And a young woman came up, this really shy and quiet, and she goes, I made this in high school, and I thought maybe you could use it. I was like, I opened it up, and how powerful is that? I mean, I was literally darn and black, and God has done so many magical things and brought such color to my life and to those around me. 
Um, so that's the first step. So I just want to say quickly that if you have not made that first step, you're here for a reason because today is the day of salvation. You can be set free. God doesn't want you to live in your past. He doesn't want you to be a victim of your past. He doesn't want you to be bound by your past. He says don't think about it, but that means take care of it. Take care of it. Let him heal you. And it's an ongoing process till you see him. Um, three years ago, I decided to join a Bible study at my church, which I knew was going to be hard. because it It's called Authentic Intimacy, and it's on sexuality. And because of my woundings, um, my sweet, sweet husband has suffered, and we've, we've had struggles in our lives. But I'm like, okay, it's time. And then I also agreed to be a table leader. And then I also found a therapist that I really knew and trusted, and I got to work. And it was hard. But it was time. You know, he doesn't give you something before you're able. So you don't have to worry about it. You take that first step, he'll be right there, okay? The second scripture says, Behold, I'm doing a new thing, yet it spring up. Will you see it? I'm making a roadway in the wilderness and a river in the desert. So we're talking about steps, being obedient to steps. So I want to tell you about two steps I took that were decades apart. Fifteen years ago, my grandson was in the hospital for observation, and it, it ended up being nothing. But my daughter called me and said, oh, you need to volunteer there. There are babies crying, and they don't have family. You need to go there. Well, it was a few years after my kids were out of the house. Um, I don't work outside the home. I used to go back and work at the business whenever they fired somebody or needed somebody or whatever. But... I didn't. I was involved with my local church. I love my neighbors, but I thought, you know, I need to get out in the community. And my kids really never had to go there. And I love children. I taught Sunday school for like 30 years at my old church. And I'm like, yeah, this is my wheelhouse. So I began to volunteer there. And about six years ago, um, about six years ago, we had a medical emergency happen in our family. We had a loved one rush to the hospital. We had a grandbaby born C-section, miraculously sent to Children's. My uh, family member was life flighted to Cleveland Clinic, and we all drove up there and tried to find the right building on a campus of 22 buildings and find the right floor and the right waiting room. And it was after hours, and we finally all settled in there. I have such a supportive family. There was a lot of us. And, um, but there was nobody there working. And so I just started looking at papers and trying to find an extension I could call to get, to get, some up, a, get an update or get some information. Because, see, I had worked 10 years in the surgery waiting room at Children's. And so at the time, I didn't see it. But later, I did. He provided a very practical road in the wilderness. That night, I was very calm. I, you know, I'm used to being in a hospital setting. And um, so God used that, that step that I took 10 years before to provide a, a, a roadway for me. And, and people were like, how are you so calm? I was like, it's Jesus. It's, you know, it's Jesus. Um, and then that same year, one of the things, I love the word so much, that one of the things I do is I pick a book in the Bible, and each morning... I just take a few verses and meet with God about it. I may do other things too, studies and devotionals and stuff, but I really like to go line upon line in the word and just listen to what he's saying and, um, you know, get a promise or be convicted or, you know, uh, just have joy in the spending time with him. And I decided to go in Psalms. And I want to tell you, one of the things I told the girls last night was I'm excited to see how he threads today together because Noelle, she is crazy. She, like, just asked us to do it and didn't even tell us what to say or give us scriptures or assignments. I mean, we have the basic core to what we're supposed to talk about today. But I was like, this is going to be so powerful. So Jess um, actually read verse by verse, the scripture that I w found myself in that week, that week that my loved one was, you know, on the brink of dying or living, and it was Psalms 139. And so immediately, and I didn't see the road until later, 
but I immediately saw the spring. I saw the spring. I saw God watering me and filling me and saying, I've got this. I've got this. You know? And um, I just, I love that about his word. So, so those are, when you take steps, you, they, they could be just innocuous. You don't know, but he'll show you. You just have to take the step, okay? So the second step is God's steps are full of direction and refreshment in the hard times. You're not alone in the hard times. And the thing I love about this conference is that we are real about how hard it is to live this life, how hard it is here on earth, you know? But he is enough for us. He is enough. Okay, the next verse is... The beasts of the field will glorify me, the jackal and the ostrich, because I've given waters in the wilderness and desert to give drink to my chosen daughters. Now, when God says something twice in a row, that's important, right? So the next step is that God's steps are for others. So ladies, I want you to just think about this. Whether or not you're in the marketplace, whether you're in a boardroom or a lunchroom, a hospital room, whether you're in your living room, your playroom, your laundry room, or whether you're in a classroom. What steps you take, everyone around, wherever you are, it's for them. Because he's wanting to show forth his glory for them. Now, why he picked three types of animals, and I mean, you know, I mean, I'm sure there's some people that we know that are kind of like beasts or ostriches or I, I don't have time to go into that but I'm taking it that it's it's for others okay and then the last step of this portion is the chosen women who I form for myself will declare my praise so whether you have to climb a step that looks like I'm just a baby and just can hardly get up it or whether you just need to open up the door okay just open up the doors or whether you're dancing like my friend Margie Shout out to Margie. <laughs> um, the point is that he does it for his, himself. And, and I, I saw The Shack. I don't know how many of you read the book or saw the movie, but it really got me to see how Papa and how Jesus, our friend, and how the Holy Spirit delight in when we're doing things. It, he does it for himself, but it's kind of like my daughter went to Ikea last week and she, she put a, a video on Instagram, and um, her, her husband did, and he goes, this is what it looks like when ballet breaks out at Ikea. And my youngest granddaughter, Leah, who is another miracle baby, was twirling through the aisles, just twirling, just twirling. And, and Trisha told me a few days ago that she kept saying, see, Mommy, I don't have to take lessons. I can just twirl and twirl. And honestly, wherever you're at, wherever you're moving, because God wants you to move, he delights in you. He delights in you. He's enough, and we are enough because he is. And the last verse I want to leave you with, I'll bring you up to date for me. They that wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. They will mount up with wings of eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will not walk and not faint. So I'm in a time of waiting. When I came to the conference last year, I actually went back to the back, which, by the way, there are going to be people back there to pray with you if you ever wanted to have any kind of prayer needs. I went back to the back and had prayer because there was something that God was burning on my heart that is so outside the box that I get weird looks at me. But I still know that I'm supposed to do it. But it's, I'm promoting it, but I'm not promoting because it's not going anywhere. Nothing's happening with it right now. So God steps while you wait are full of strength, and they're full of action. While you're waiting, there's action. But it's if you have your eyes on him. So someday, if you see a larger-than-life statue like this, downtown Akron, honoring the individual rubber workers with pavings of bricks, where you can buy a brick for your loved one, and it says where they worked, what their job was, and, and their name, and you can show that to later generations of how Akron started, it's dead in the water right now, but I, and I'm not a community activist, and I'm not a fundraiser, but, um, but I know that I'm enough. <laughs>